All right, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Poma. I'm the Vice President of the Montgomery Art Association. For those of you who are not familiar with us, MAA is a nonprofit here in Montgomery County, Maryland. And uh, we are a, a group of fine artists in the entire DC region, 300 members strong. And we host art shows and art training and social events for, um, for artists. So we're very happy to have you with us today. Um, we are here today um, sort of as a, a showcase event for one of our uh, art shows, online exhibitions, which is called Our Stories, Our Journeys. Artists were, um, member artists were invited to submit an artwork around the theme of journeys and not just to submit the artwork to, but also to submit a short narrative telling the story behind that piece. And as part of that, we had a cohort of artists who went through some story training with an expert storyteller named Esther Choi of the leadership or the storytell leadership storytelling lab. Uh, that's a group out of Chicago. We did some rehearsals and we got ready for tonight's event. Um, and we're really excited to be here with you. Uh, before I introduce the artist speakers, I first wanted to introduce Marcy from the Bender JCC and uh, for some welcome remarks. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Um... I'm thrilled to be here and the JCC is thrilled to partner with MAA for this evening's event. We were originally supposed to have this in person um, and then um, we all know what happened. <laughs> so we're very fortunate that we were able to partner with you and do what we could to support it. Um, if I may just help just give you a little bit of information about the JCC. The Bender JCC is an all-inclusive community from the people we serve to the programs we offer, all rooted in Jewish values. We are a fitness center, a preschool, a summer camp, and an art gallery. We are a parenting center, grandparenting center, a movie theater for film screenings, screenings, excuse me, and a place to hear an engaging speaker. We are a community of communities and our doors are open to everybody. And we look forward to seeing people in person very soon and to partnering again with hopefully a beautiful exhibit in our gallery. And we'll turn it back to Elisa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me introduce today our storytellers and then we'll get started with our first story. So the our six speakers today are Liz Sotrovic, Leslie Riley, Joyce Smith, Teresa Seitz, Miguel Mitchell, and Shana Heller. So we are going to start with Liz because her last name starts with Z. No doubt she always has to go last in things. So we shook it up and we're having Liz go first today. So Liz, over to you. Are you there, Liz? I'm so sorry. See, Not she wasn't prepared, I was she's always last. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, this piece is called The Scouts. It's 12 by 16 inches. I'm done in colored pencil, in case you're wondering. And this is my story about it. When tracking, hunting, or being hunted or tracked, there are many senses at work. Our sight, our smell, even knowing the direction of the wind should you want to aim an arrow or be upwind of your prey. This little scout is the granddaughter of a girl I went to summer camp with, where we learned all those outdoor skills, knowing the weather by the clouds, how to get somewhere at night with no flashlight or to read the stars. We could name every flower and knew the time by the bugles. When I went back as an adult to be program director of the same camp, I saw my work in real time. A bugle blew and the girls all went where I had scheduled them. I understood properly for the first time how the clouds moved in our atmosphere, atmosphere, and I would have to read them as I was taught when they blocked the satellite and our internet went out to tell the campers where to go next and then play the bugles for attention or recall. Each summer, some sort of wildlife takes up residence. 
One summer it was skunks, another raccoons, bats, things with rabies my then toddler daughter could give you instructions on. And then there was the bear. We found it like to sleep in the sweet smelling manure pile by the riflery range, meandering over at night past the owl cabin, the oldest girl's cabin, rubbing past the side of their building to scratch itself with their muffled shrieks inside. Shrieking with laughter, most likely, the girls loved to scare themselves as they learned to be brave. We used to try to tell campfire stories about someone escaping from the federal prison nearby, Danamora, but everyone would just laugh now. They put those guys away for life up in the Adirondacks. The ones who did escape a few years back walked in circles, being bug bitten and getting more and more lost. They probably just about set foot on camp property, but never made it through the woods the youngest of our girls can track through at night. So once there was the rabid raccoon, the riflery instructor had to shoot it off the back porch eaves to the tears of one counselor who I had to tell quite harshly, there are 150 girls here and one rabid raccoon. Rabies being a thing up north now, we do not just swing a tennis racket at a bat and shoo it out the door. It's caught with a long pool skimmer looking net and placed in a Tupperware in the freezer with the dates marked. My daughter would accompany me to the health department where they were tested, even grazing the skin you could pass the disease. So when my little girl came home for kindergarten back in the Northern Virginia suburbs, they asked the kids to give Thanksgiving recipes to make a funny cookbook for the parents. A lot of the boys said you could put the turkey in the microwave for 10 minutes, not my daughter. She started the recipe at the beginning. You get in the car and go out and shoot a turkey. When I draw with colored pencils, it takes a very long time. I could oil paint you quicker, I always say. I have time to think about all these things. They become part of the story of the picture. It was January, the winter of 2020. My daughter is older now, now and a ballet dancer. She was rehearsing Sleeping Beauty with the National Ballet of Canada. The Kennedy Center is a long drive, so I was waiting on the top floor feeling cold and getting sick and drawing. I always bring a drawing when she dances or auditions. So many tourists were coming through for the Lunar New Year display. Some countries had already begun shutting down travel. So I wondered where all these people might have come from as they swarmed around me to see what I was doing. I wanted to tell them to please stay away. I did not mean for this to be a dark or ominous piece, but little did I know how powerful it would turn out to be. These little scouts are the vanguards. I see it in something, I see in it something foreboding now about the world we are letting our children grow up in. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, we would be happy to take any questions. You can type a question in the chat uh, or uh, raise your hand. Use the raise hand button to ask any questions. Uh, you could ask it now or uh, we'll take questions at the end. Was that the beginning of COVID? Were you, were you getting sick? Yes, it was the beginning of COVID and we'll never know, those of us who were sick that December and January, whether we got antibodies then or with our vaccines now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was sick and it was just, just starting to reach here. Liz, how long does a piece like this take? Um, my pieces take a very long time. It's almost like every little hair, you're almost embroidering the piece rather than, you know, painting is broad strokes and you get all the fur bristles and pencils are stroke by stroke. So they take about um, a month if I'm doing really good, you know, fitting it in around my classes as well, but um, sometimes longer, especially the really large pieces, so. Great. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Seitz. Hi, Teresa. Thank you. Thanks, hi. Hi, here's my story. It was the first day of 70 degree weather in 2021. This day was special, a perfect day after a long cold winter stuck inside 
and facing all the challenges of 2020. Today felt like a new day filled with new possibilities. The winter was behind us. It was 70 degrees. The sun was shining. I opened the windows. Fresh air was filtering in and the daffodils were in bloom. During the cold winter of 2020, I was new to Instagram. I began regularly posting and sharing my artwork with the online community and built an archive of my work online. Today was no different. However, today I was challenging myself to share a new artwork on Instagram. I had already posted so many artworks and I was looking to post an artwork that reflected the special day today. I needed to create something new. So I went for a walk to think about what to create. I was inspired by the sights and sounds, the 70 degree sunshine and pastel colors of the flowers in bloom. The streets were alive with activity, bikers, walkers, and children playing. I saw pl flowers peeking out over the painted home addresses sprayed on the curb. I had an idea. When I returned home, I wondered what I would create to capture the day. I sorted through many canvases I had created in progress and began working, hoping to capture the day. Suddenly, I saw this colorful pastel canvas that I had already completed and so many of the colors related to those I had seen outside on my walk. Inspired by the spray paint I had seen on my walk, I created a stencil of fresh flowers to overlay on top of the spring colors. After completion, I posted my new creation to Instagram, achieving my daily challenge. I posted sharing that for me, this piece represented the first 70 degree day of 2021 for me, a special day after a long winter. I was thrilled that so many related to this post and could appreciate the joy of a perfect day, the arrival of spring after a long winter. Though this is a simple story, the joy of creating and sharing is what made this piece and the day so memorable. That's my story. Thank you. Wow, it, it, it's, it has so much depth of field and texture um, and you, the, seeing the piece, hearing your story just made it all come alive. I can feel that air. I can see the flowers. I'm probably sneezing from the daffodils. Um, it, it really feels multi-sensory, even though we're looking at something two-dimensional. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that came through. Great. Any questions for Teresa? Can you tell us what materials you used? This has so many layers. Um, <laughs> it's acrylic. Um, then there's oil stick. It, you can see kind of the textured um, areas. Those are oil stick. Um, there's oil paint. There's also um, oil marker. Um, so like you can see kind of some scribbles here and there. There's some um, oil pastels. Um, if you look at kind of the black streaks kind of running throughout. Um, and then the on top is uh, spray paint. So um, there's, it's a mixed media piece <laughs> for sure. And you made the stencils for the flowers yourself? Those were from a, I have a number of, uh, like they're, they're like hole punches that are mm. uh, in these different shapes. So mm -hmm. I combined those to make the stencils. Erin uh, is asking how long this piece took to make. This was a work in progress for such a long time and it went through so many different versions before it got to this point. So it was, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I would say if you looked at it from the beginning, I mean, it would be maybe a year of working on this canvas and trying to figure out where it was going until that one day where I saw it and I thought, this is perfect. It's gonna work for this particular idea. Uh, but before that, it was just going from stage to stage to stage. Mm -hmm. um, Marcy says, I see what looks like candlelight towards the bottom right. Is that what it is? Let's see, bottom right. Oh yeah, I see, I see that. Um, 
Well, the, the background, I'm kind of thinking of it as more of a um, mixture of abstract marks. So um, that's great if that's coming through, but it's, it's more just an abstract um, piece with the stencil overlaid. Great. Teresa, thank you so much. Thank this you. It's wonderful. Okay, we're next going to turn to Leslie Riley. Hi, Leslie. Hello. Thank you for doing this, by the way, both with <laughs> ACC and MAA. And this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> when I saw the call for entry, I immediately went to this piece that was started probably in the mid 90s. And just finished this year because I had set it aside. Um, it was actually a turning point in my life. Back in the 90s, around the age of 45, I remember sitting on the edge of my bed and I was on the edge of despair. I was so unhappy. The child of the 50s, I had everything I'd ever dreamed of, an amazing husband. He was my high school sweetheart. We're still married 50 years. Um, had six happy and healthy children and a wonderful home in the neighborhood I always wanted to, I grew up in and I got to stay in. But there was just something, you know, I was, I, I was really scared because I was so unhappy even though I had it all. So once I stopped to figure it out, I realized that I'd been so busy taking care of others and helping my husband with his business and raising the kids, just making sure everything was okay for everybody else. And you know where this is going. I had forgotten about me. And I just, I knew that if I started to work with the materials that I had originally started with back in the seventies, that I, you know, at least I could be doing something five minutes a day, just something to connect myself with my creativity. So I returned to the art form that I'd started with back in the 70s when I had my, um, I was pregnant in 71 and um, a woman taught me how to quilt. It was the beginning of the quilt revival in the United States. And it was slowly, you know, becoming a big thing and I started making baby quilts for my firstborn. And it was, it's just always been a material that I have felt at home with. It's soft, it's comforting, it's beautiful. It's got pattern, color, design, everything, you know, an artist could want. So um, you could call me a fabri fabriholic. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's been fabric and textiles have been my primary art form since I made that first quilt in 1971. And, you know, if you think about it, cloth, fabric, textile, whatever you want to call it, it's a part of our lives from birth through death. So it's just something that everybody can relate to. And I, I love turning it into stories. I consider myself to be a narrative quilter or art quilter. So this quilt is one of a series that I made back then exploring the issues around reclaiming my creative self. I hadn't had the time to really, you know, do art full time or even every day, but I just took every five or 10 minutes that I could steal. I also, for some crazy reason, decided to go back and complete my um, undergrad degree at the University of Maryland, something I had started back in 1970. And well, as you can tell, life got in the way. So I um, took my, I'd had a lot of different credits in different areas, but I thought women's studies was a nice place to tie them all together. The art and design credits and, um, all my other interests. And when I was there and, and doing all the reading and research that that degree required, I really got interested in women's stories or the lack of women's stories and how their lives and creativity had been squashed for so long. Definitely for the generations that came before me, but I had seen it in my own baby boomer generation as well whole time I'm doing this and working with the quilts and the fabric and going to school, I'm thinking, oh my God, what if I had never ever, you know, found my creative voice or, 
or reached for my creativity and actually started working towards um, something for myself, something that came from me for me and made me feel happy. And boy, does it make me feel happy. I know all the other artists here can agree. <laughs> but um, it was such a scary thought that what if I had never found it? I, my first thought really was to say, I've got to tell other women about this. I've got to let them know that they don't need to have like the studio, uh, open expansive hours of time and the materials that if you just take five minutes a day for whatever it is, whether your art is gardening or, or painting or, you know, whatever you consider to be your art, cooking, cooking is another art, just to be doing it to take, take that into your own hands and create your life like that. So it was, um, I started sharing my story with the world, literally, because I built myself a website in 1999. That was one of the things I had studied prior to getting my woman's studies degree. So it was a story that obviously had resonated and it has led me on this journey towards the art career that I do have today. Now this piece I designed to be a portrait of a woman giving birth to herself. The image is a transfer that I did. I spent several years trying to figure out how Robert Rauschenberg transferred images onto different surfaces. So this was one of my early transfers um, using, I forget what it is, but it's mineral spirits or something that's pretty toxic, but I don't do that kind of transfers anymore. But as I was finishing it up and I stamped alongside, yeah, you probably can't see it in the image on the screen, but it says portrait of a woman giving birth to herself. And when I finished stamping that last word herself, I went, oh, I am giving birth to my self, the me on the inside that you know nobody else can see. It's myself. I'm finally I feel like I'm myself and as any artist also knows, we're truly at home in ourselves when we are creating art. So when this call for our stories, our journeys was made, I just thought this is, the, this is what I have to share. So I, it was at the time just a quilt top, which is the top part of the quilt. And to make a quilt, you need the batting in the middle and a packing. So I finished it up. So started in the 90s, it's done in the ninth, in, well, in the 90s, in 2021. And in closing, I'd like to say, as George Eliot said, it's never too late to be who you might have been. And George Eliot, in case you don't know, was a woman. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I think this piece is important in so many ways. And what I immediately thought of was how a woman, a mother of six children, a wife, sort of gets lost, gets pushed to the side or the back. Everyone else's needs and priorities come first. And by doing art, in a way, you're honoring yourself. You're putting your needs first, your need to be expressive and creative. Um, so this is just really touching, Leslie, thank you. Um, a few questions have come in. Um, did you sew the fabrics on paper and does the zipper in the artwork represent a certain phase in your life? Good question. It's all 100% fabric. Even what looks like a zipper is a trim. It's been dyed um, to give it that rainbow look. But for me, that was like the dividing line between, you know, the busy plaid, the busy life, and then this rebirth that was happening. But it is all fabric and all stitched on that black and white background fabric. And can you remind us of the size? It's about um, 30 by 40. 30 by 40. Okay. And is there significance to the colors you chose? Not really. I think I just, I intuitively reach for fabrics. I work very intuitively with color and fabrics and I just use what speaks to me. I, sometimes I have fabrics that are 20 years old and I just buy them because I love them. And then one day I'll go, that's 
the piece I need for this project. So um, I'd say it's just all done intuitively, but I just know when it comes together, you know, it's again, back on to the intuition. Mm -hmm. And uh, one comment, you were courageous to pick up and start over. Did your husband and children understand what you were doing and why? I don't think they understood what I was doing. Um, now they they get it. I mean, they're grown up now. And uh, at the time I was working with my husband in, we had a small business um, appraising real estate. And um, I wanted to, become a full-time artist but if I did that I would be leaving him so as soon as I started making money doing <laughs> doing my art then my husband was very understanding but he's always been <laughs> so supportive and it's never complained about me taking over the kitchen or the dining room or whatever so um, and my children I think they're very proud of me they don't always understand what or why I do it but maybe they do and they just don't tell me. <laughs> well, um, are you quilting on regular sewing machine or using one of the big long arm machines, Beverly asks. Beverly, I have a non-computerized Bernina sewing machine that I've had since the 90s when I treated myself to a nice machine. I started with um, a little well, it's a vintage or antique now, Singer machine. So I, I did all of my early quilts on that small machine. And I recently have become an ambassador for Benina. So they will be loaning me a super deluxe machine. And I feel like I've graduated to the, the big girl machine now. But no, no long arm at this point. And if I can humble brag on your behalf, you've written several books, yes? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Maybe we can uh, on Facebook share some of those books so that people can learn a little bit more. And thank you for um, being so honest and vulnerable in, in telling us about your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's move on to our next artist, Joyce. Hello. Let's find Joyce here in the window. There you are. All right, Joyce, uh, if you could unmute. There okay. you go. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I call this portrait. It's it's a twelve by. Uh, I mean, a sixteen by twenty two portrait in oil. I call it a penny for her thoughts and yours. Over the past year, have you found yourself in deep contemplation? Have you wanted to or been asked to share your thoughts? I suspect that like you, we all want to move past pandemic related thoughts at this point. But for many visual artists, the past year has been a very productive one. So here are my thoughts. In my portrait of six-year-old Maggie, my question to you is, what is she thinking as she gazes out over this inlet in Maine? <clears throat> I tried to capture a sense of quiet mystery, both in her gaze and profile glazed by the late afternoon sun and in her loosely clasped hands. Last summer, she was on vacation after a couple of months of school by Zoom. The pandemic, the pandemic was raging. I wondered how much she was taking it all in. Will this have a lasting impact on her? Is she tired of masking, feeling anxious, missing her friends, angry that her routines have been disrupted, scared that she or her parents might get sick? Does she feel comfortable as she does she feel comfort as she looks out toward the ocean? What do you guess her thoughts may be as you see this portrait? Do you see worry? Do you see hope? Perhaps this painting painting evokes similar questions and concerns about your children, your grandchildren. <laughs> I spent 10 months in Maine last year 
fleeing Maryland and returning in late March. Painting proved to be my mainstay, a wonderful creative outlet and great ballast in a world of heartbreaking troubles. Finding beauty in nature and attempting to recreate this on canvas provided many hours of solace and transcendent concentration. I began my artistic journey years ago in childhood when I spent hours outside observing nature, trees, shadows, light, and tried to draw this. In high school, I had some success with a pen and ink drawing that was accepted and entered into a county and state competition. My artistic talents then went dormant redirected and replaced by my social work career and raising three children. In 2000, I decided that I wanted to draw a portrait of my youngest child before she left for college. From that drawing class, I evolved to painting in oils with Walt Bartman at the Yellow Barn in Glen Echo. With his encouragement, I rediscovered the latent talent I had in childhood. During pandemic time in Maine, I organized a socially distanced outdoor art show. Who knew I had that skill? Um, <clears throat> I sold paintings there and at the River Arts Gallery in Damariscotta. I also had paintings selected for several, several juried shows, both here in Maine and, and in Maine. When painting, I become immersed in my work. I am most successful painting landscapes, people, and animals when I find a connection both to them, to myself, and to that magical flow of creative process. I can be so quietly concentrated doing plein air paintings that squirrels, birds, rabbits come by going about their business, sometimes stopping to stare. It's really quite charming. As we all emerge from the collective trauma of the past 15 months, many would include the past five years, I hope we can let go of some of our stress and enjoy the summer of 2021, vaccinated and mask free. I encourage you to find and savor the beauty in your surroundings and in your families. Maybe even try reach, <clears throat> reaching back into your six-year-old childhood toolbox of dormant creativity and find ways to express your latent talents through music, art, writing, dancing, things you loved to do as a child. There are so many openings to your own creativity if you give yourself a chance. Let your inner critic take a vacation or at least a step back enough to guide you but not inhibit you. Sometimes all it takes is a little nudge and a penny for your thoughts. And I wanna thank you. And I wanna give a shout out to my model granddaughter, Maggie Gilbreth, and to Esther Choi for her encouragement to tell stories. I hope my, my journey inspires you as well. Joyce, thank you so much. Um, aside from hoping that you'll put the address of your beach house into the chat so that we can come visit you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I really like um, how evocative this is of childhood and, and our memories. And um, you've, you've gotten my gears turning of some things that I've did as a child that perhaps I could incorporate into my art. Thank you. Um, lots of lovely comments in the chat. Um, Chitra is asking, uh, she says, this painting looks so real. I'm wondering what she's looking at, what she's thinking about, and most important, who is she? The way you have captured her body language is remarkable. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that and um, on what, you're th what you were thinking about with capturing her body language. Well, it's that mystery. It, what is she thinking? I'm trying to be, you know, evocative and pro and provocative in this painting. Um, I'm guessing what she might be thinking. Um, you know, it's kind of does she have hope? Does she have fear? What's going on here? So that's what I was going for, sort of that mystery. Mm -hmm. And 
a mystery to um, hopefully involve the viewer. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Um, some comments that, um, that it reminds me of Van Gogh's artistry. Uh, the painting is wonderful, stunning, exceptional, emotional, and a lovely story. Um, and I forgot to mention uh, to all of the artists who are here today, our speakers, if you have a website and you would like to um, pop that into the chat, um, I'm sure some members of our audience would love to see some others of your work. Um, was this painted uh, from her modeling for you from a photograph or uh, from memory? Um, all three. All three. Uh, yeah, probably, you know, the photograph, but I know her very well, too. So there's that aspect of it. And, you know, I, I saw a lot of her and see a lot of her. So. Great. She's also quite artistic. Oh, excellent. We're all happy to hear that. Joyce, thank you so very much. Well, thank you. And thank, thank Esther. <laughs> yes, sure will. All right. Um, Miguel is our next speaker. Uh, give me a moment and I'll spotlight you. Hi, Miguel. Hi. Okay, let me uh, start here. Uh, one thing I want to say is that what really drew me back into um, art, because I was away from it for a very long time, actually several decades, really came from my exploration of this concept I call otherness. And by that, I mean something that makes something outside of our common experience is still worthy of investigation. And there are many other ways people have defined otherness. Um, it's intriguing, it's emotion laden, and it plucks at the heartstrings of our humanity. And the themes that fall quite neatly into otherness are science fiction and fantasy, which I love. And they lead us to wonder, to aspire, to challenge our assumptions about the universe. So I, I started working on this painting as a, as a challenge. I wanted to mix my knowledge of chemistry. I, I'm a retired chemist. And I, and, and I wanted to mix that with painting and create something that wasn't entirely predictable. I just wanted to let go and tell a story that brought in my love of science fiction. So when you first look at this painting, the focal point is this multi-limbed creature. And it's carrying what looks like a torch and it's just outside a cave. And you might initially feel repelled because this creature isn't human, but then you can see that a foreleg is tentatively raised to enter the dark cave. It's not rushing into the darkness. It appears to be scared of the unknown, just like we would be. So now you might see this creature differently. You might recognize the personhood, the humanity in an alien, in otherness. Could you go to the next slide, please? Okay. Now, another aspect of this painting is phosphorescence, which occurs after it's charged with sunlight or a black light or just a powerful lamp. So what you get from phosphorescence is a delayed glow in the dark after exposure to light. In this case, it's very efficient and uh, the phosphorescence can last over an hour after being exposed to light for 30 minutes. And as you can see, it creates an entirely different type of painting. So it's almost like it tells a different story. So the third aspect of this painting, if you look at the ground, are these symbols I've drawn on the flat stones. And your eyes might notice that if you really look carefully, there are symbols. What do these symbols mean? Who left them there? Are they a warning about the cave? Are they instructions of some sort? This part is the final theme of otherness in this painting, obscure knowledge left to be investigated. And that's pretty much what I have to say about it. <laughs> Thank you, Miguel. You know, you, you remind me that it's so, 
it, it, it pulls you into art so much more when you hear even just a tidbit of a story behind the piece. Um, I, I never would have taken these things necessarily on my own, but now that you've uh, told me, I'm, I want to go look at it longer. I want to look at the first piece. So actually, if you go back to the previous yeah. slide, you'll see now you can more easily see the, uh, the, the uh, symbols. Right. I was thinking they were flowers. Like this looks like a flower. They sort of look like hibiscus flowers. But now they're symbols. Oh, great. Um, Martina says it's a very cool piece. I enjoy the symbolism and the thought process. Uh, very creative. Um, it's always satisfying to combine two areas of your life, chemistry and art. Um, Teresa is, loves the, the mystery. She says the mystery is so interesting. What medium, what media did you use for this? Well, it's a, it's a combination of non-fluorescent and fluorescent acrylic on canvas with a, um, a kind of a, a glaze that contains a phosphorescent compound. And that um, glaze is placed in different regions of the, of the painting. And it hardens with time. And are these um, specialty materials that you have to order or? Yeah, you have to order the, um, these are things that you, anyone can order. You can order them on, mm -hmm. on Amazon. Um, but you have to you have to know what to order specifically the phosphorescent materials. That's the picky one because if you order the wrong kind, you get a really uh, poor poor effect. Mm -hmm. But um, there are these europium compounds and they work really really well. So mm -hmm. that's what I use. Uh, does your previous career show itself in your creative explorations? Yeah, I mean just like it does um, here. And in many of my pieces, including some of my 3D pieces, I also um, create phosphorescent um, sea serpents and other things. Mm -hmm. Did in your chemistry career, did you work with phosphorescent materials? Indeed, I did. Oh. I was a phosphorescent material. I, I worked with materials that naturally produce light, chemiluminescent materials. Wow. It's actually one of the things that kept me interested in chemistry. I've always found that that light light production by in nature was just always fascinating to me. I always thought it was lovely. So you know, you think about fireflies. I I, I just always thought it was wonderful. Bioluminescent bays from the algae, just mm -hmm. just beautiful. And uh, Joyce asked if this glows in the dark. It does. It will glow in the dark for over an hour after you let it sit in front of a lamp for thirty minutes, and intensely. So uh, that picture was just taken in the dark. I just turned off the lights and took a picture. All right. I think you've just inspired our next art show. <laughs> Glow in the dark works. Wow, Miguel, thank you so much for sharing the creativity and the science behind your artwork. And I think we're, we're all pretty fascinated and like to learn some more someday from you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and our final speaker tonight is Shana Heller, and she is going to uh, present her work to us. Hi, Shana. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am a rising glass artist, and I'd like to share a little bit of that origin story with you tonight. Um, did you ever have one of those aha moments when you know it's the perfect fit for you? Well, my aha moment and adventure into glass fusing started when a friend invited me to a fused glass jewelry making workshop just a few years ago. What I thought would be just another pleasant ladies night out turned out to be an inspiration for my next hands-on creative outlet. As I wandered around that glass studio that day, each piece I saw intrigued me. How was it made? Could other techniques be used? I wondered if I could combine my artwork with the glass. I returned to that glass studio as often as I could while I was still working full time, evenings, Sundays, lunch breaks, even coffee breaks. I, I just couldn't get enough of it. Do you believe in kismet, fate, divine destiny, one of those? I'm pretty sure I do, because what was amazing to me was the timing of everything that led to my current situation. Uh, in December, 2019, the glass studio I had been frequenting 
closed and sold off their equipment and supplies. So I bought one of their kilns and the other basics to set up a home based studio of my own for this new hobby. Oh, but then where was I gonna install it safely, you know? So I finally cleared out my garage and converted it to that home art studio I've always wanted. Construction was completed just before COVID hit. Now, not only that, now I worked in the graphic design field for over 44 years, the last 25 of them in management in a corporate environment, you don't get much opportunity to do the hands-on design work. So I'd promised myself I would get back to the fine arts when I retired, anticipating that that would be two or three years out. Well, that opportunity came early when, like so many others this past year, I was forced into retirement. But the timing couldn't, be better, couldn't have been better. At home, with, for the COVID confinement, I had more time to spend in the studio. And with the help of a business mentor from the SBA SCORE program and a career coach from Career Arc, I launched a business, not just a hobby. I was over ambitious at first, trying to make large complex pieces that just ended up burnt or bubbled. So I turned back to the tech whizzes that ran the glass studio where I was introduced to this medium. And as always, they were super helpful with their guidance. Then as I continued to explore and experiment, I became more proficient at creating most of what I intended but fused glass is an unpredictable medium and I quick, learned quickly how to be okay with the unexpected. But like a kid in a candy store, I look forward to lifting the lid after each fusing and marvel at the range of results. The glass Seder plate is a great example of that. I had a brief oh no moment after lifting the lid when I saw that the artwork embedded between the glass had pulled apart more than expected. But then I realized the final piece fit the theme and purpose even better. Now the representation of the parting of the Red Sea was more active with the sandbar rising and the turmoil of the sea, more acute. So the official title of this Seder plate is The Parting Journey to Freedom. Every year at the Passover Seder, my family and friends relive the Exodus. We envision ourselves personally experiencing that anxious moment, you know, backs to the sea, no apparent escape from the encroaching Egyptians. God splits the waters. We walk across the dry seabed and we're safely across and God closes the passage. That moment inspired this 10 inch Seder plate. In its original glass embedded painting, the sand bridge surfaces as the blue waters of the Red Sea part. That was my intent. Now, a little bit about the technique. It's a multi-step process. Uh, I start by painting on kiln safe paper. Uh, this Thin fire paper, as it's called, won't burn up in the kiln. Um, my color palette includes teal and dark blue, golden rod, and actually some gold paint. The painting is fused between a, a clear tecta sheet and, of glass and also um, a, on a black opal. And after that fusing, I have to fuse it again. The flat piece is placed back in the kiln for another fusing to what we call slump it into the Seder plate form. And I'm, I'm glad to say that I still feel that excitement of every glass piece I work on. Kiln form glass, you know, it can be functional, like a plate, decorative, um, like a painting or treated as fine art. Um, and I invite you to explore my gallery to decide for yourself, which it is for you. That's artbyshana.com. I posted it as um, requested. Um, and I welcome your questions about this. Thank you. Shana, thank you. Um, can you talk to us about your color choices? Mm -hmm. So uh, in this instance, um, I very much wanted to emote the sense of sand and sea. Um, and uh, so the, uh, and also the, that froth of the splitting. So using the blues and the dark blues and the teals for the water and um, literally a golden rod and a gold uh, creates these sandy colors uh, for us. So that it's, it's uh, paint that is also specific for use in fused glass. Basically it's, it's a liquid kind of glass. Um, Great. Um, Teresa had just asked actually if the gold has an iridescence to it. 
Yes, it does, but um, it doesn't quite shine in the dark. <laughs> Miguel will hook you up with some chemicals to help. Yeah, that might be very interesting, Miguel. I, I would try it. Um, and how large is this piece? Um, it's a 10 inch plate. Um, you can see um, some of the depressions here. There are the six cup depressions oh, used yeah. in a Seder plate. Um, if it were tilted on its side, you would see it's about a half inch deep. Mm -hmm. And do you tend to work in smaller, larger sizes? Is this pretty typical of your size? Well, I'm limited by the size of my kiln with mm. the, um, and the kiln block is 15 inches wide. So that's about the size of an individual piece. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will combine separate pieces um, and put them together. Um, but what's really fascinating, I learned something new every day about this medium. Um, and as I say, it, it's fairly new to me and I just love the exploration of it. And I feel very renewed as an artist coming into a new medium. Um, and, uh, you know, my studio is my happy place. I'm just, uh, as I was saying, I, I could be in there all night and day. Um, I love that. Um, so uh, some of the feedback, gorgeous, wonderful depth. The artistry is exquisite. Um, Marcy observed that she, I can see what looks like the image of the tree of life which adds a whole nother story to that the piece. It, yes, it does. And uh, well, you know, I kind of think of it as somewhat of a Rorschach test. You know, <laughs> you can see a lot into many of these types of pieces. I do other pieces as well, but I'm very, very fond of this technique for um, the fused glass. Yeah. Um, do you, Ch 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 Chitra is asking, do you have any control on what it would look like when you open that kiln, or is it always a surprise? No, there's, a, there's pretty much control over it, you know, and especially as I learn what will happen as I combine certain elements. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, but there, there is always that element of supplies. There's a certain science to glass fusing where the glass always wants to kind of melt down to um, a certain thickness of six millimeters. So no matter how many stacks of glass you start with, that's what it's gonna do. Mm. And, um, and so it might stretch and pull if you use different depths of glass, um, or if you put this paper between the glass, or if you choose to paint on top of the glass, you can get other kinds of um, more vivid colors. Um, mm. There's just lots of different things to, um, that you can do. Well, wonderful. Maybe we could go into your studio with you over Zoom and do a, see a demo one day. Um, yeah, I'd love that. Uh, yeah. Thank well, thank you so much. Um, I, I think my main takeaway today uh, is that we kind of never know what is happening right now in our lives that is going to influence the future artist. Um, what happened in your past, you never would have guessed that it would incorporate into your art today. So no day is really ordinary because there's something happening today or tomorrow that might be in a part of, might be a part of your artwork tomorrow. And uh, that, that feels really exciting to me. So I, uh, with that, would like to thank everyone for joining us. We have a couple of announcements if you can stay on for just one minute. Um, as I mentioned at the top, um, all of our storytellers today are exhibiting in our online exhibit, Our Stories, Our Journeys, produced by our show manager, Martina Sestakova, who is with us tonight. Um, take a look at montgomeryart.org slash our stories for more. Uh, um, the show will be up through the end of the month. And it, as I mentioned, includes artwork and a short vignette from every artist uh, about their work. Um, if you're interested in some of our upcoming events, um, uh, our artists are currently exhibiting works depicting the Maryland countryside in the tasting room at the Wind, Wind oh gosh, here I go, Wind Ridge Winery, you try it, it's really hard to say, <laughs> up in Darnstown. Um, it's a gorgeous exhibit and, you know, the wine's not so bad either. Um, so uh, they are open and uh, taking reservations. Um, 
We are thrilled that um, after last year's hiatus, the annual Paint the Town Labor Day show will resume live in Kensington. Um, and that will be over Labor Day weekend, our, our biggest event of the year with um, 500 or more works of art uh, on display and for sale. We'll also have a plein air painting competition, demos, and some other special events to really celebrate. And we have a lot to celebrate this year. And then this uh, fall, we'll have um, what we will call the 10 by 10 show. Um, this is great because Shana, your, your works will be able to fit in your kiln. Um, all works will be 10 by 10 and on sale for $100. Uh, we wanna make sure that art, original art is affordable for everyone. And this will be just in time for the holidays. Uh, Marcy's gonna pop back in and tell us about a few um, events happening at the JCC. Hi, Marcy. Hi, thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Um, let's see, uh, we are starting to open back up slowly. So we are having some things mostly outside and we have a very exciting um, festival that's called J by J and we, um, it's in partnership with the DC JCC and it's about a week long starting this Sunday with a variety of music, art, storytelling, all kinds of things. Uh, I believe Elise is going to share. Oh, yes, here it is. Um, and you can find um, all the information on our website under the um, website that's there, Bender, jccgw.org, Arts and Ideas. Um, we also have for our first time an outdoor summer book club where we're going to be gathering outside. There's information on that um, as well on the website. We um, will definitely be having some things in our gallery, so look out for... Um, um, some calls for artists for that. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but uh, we will absolutely be having different exhibits and um, we look forward to hopefully working with some of you. Thank you again. And we were so happy to partner and be a part of this. Thank you, Marcy. Thanks for being such a wonderful partner on our event today. And uh, we look forward to partnering again in the future. And with that, I would like to say thank you to all of our artists for joining today and for all of you for being a part of our program and hearing our stories. We hope to see you at another event and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>